Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, uh, my name is Earl. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Hi everybody. Um, it is an honor and a privilege to be here. I want to... Uh, I want to thank our MC. I love this guy. I do. I don't understand a word he says, but it's beautiful. I want to wish he'd come to California and come to our meetings and just start them all. <laughs> it's just great. <laughs> the guys I sponsor would say probably, what is he saying? I said, what does it matter? You don't understand when they're talking in English, right? It doesn't matter. <laughs> so, uh, I want to thank the people that I've met here so far, every one of them. Um, I want to thank Siggy for coming to the airport and getting us and taking such good care of us and making all sorts of arrangements for us and Sola for, for uh, bringing us into her home and feeding us and taking care of us and uh, El and uh, God, just Thor, so many people that we've met that have just been so kind. And uh, I think that that's the highest compliment that I can pay anyone, is that they are kind. Um, it's a strange, crazy world, you know, and uh, there's short supply of kindness. It's just a very touching thing. This has been kind of an overwhelming day for me. I've been, uh, since I've been here, I've slept about, you know, 40 minutes in the last four days, and it seems like I'm, uh, I'm physically exhausted, but I'm um, also emotionally overwhelmed at the same time. Um, I've been uh, very, very active and committed in Alcoholics Anonymous from the day that I got here. Um, because for me, it was very simply live or die. Um, there was nothing else left to do. In my case, it was actually, um, was to, uh, the only thing I didn't do out there was stay dead. I actually did die at one point. I did not stay dead, however. <laughs> I've been uncooperative for most of my life. Uh, um, but to, uh, so I've been very, very active and have embraced this program. Um, to the best of my ability for quite a while now. And to come here, it's been, I've been holding back tears all day, just as I, as I, because of course I'm a man and I shouldn't cry publicly, though I seem to often these days, um, to be in your company, to be in this, this country and to be with you people and to see this passion for Alcoholics Anonymous, to see this to see it so alive is uh, I have nothing here to I have questions uh, <laughs> it's just uh, it's an over thank you we'll be needing more of these probably um, uh, it's just been an overwhelmingly wonderful um, soulful experience touches my soul so uh 10, 11, and 12. Uh, st- I mean, just kind of to like pull it all together. Uh, step one is what's the problem? Lack of power is my dilemma. If that is my problem, what is my solution? Step two. Thank you. Um, a power greater than myself that could restore me to sanity, soundness of mind, relieve me of the obsession to drink, the thing that keeps me from being comfortable sober. Um, I had been comfortable in my life and I had been sober in my life, but I had never been both at the same time. <laughs> To bring these together seemed to be an unreasonable goal. It seemed unreasonable to me that if I could just not go back into the madness, this would be a deal that I would take. But the idea to to walk the earth a free man, to be comfortable sober, I mean, I suffer from an allergy of the body and an obsession of the mind. Um, I kick and I come to AA and I think, like most alcoholics, I'm better now. I no longer am in the throes of a physical phenomenon of craving. Yet the greater aspect of my disease is still a full effect. The obsession of the mind. In the book it says the persistence of this illusion is astonishing. Many of us pursue it to the gates of insanity and death. I am a gate guy. I go right to the gates. I have been in mental institutions. I have been tagged. I have had a toe tag on. Dead boy. And if I, for me, it's, it's not about stopping drinking and using. It's how do I stay stopped. The only way I can stay stopped and allow the process of recovery to become the process of my life is if I can get comfortable sober. The only way to be comfortable sober is to be relieved of the obsessive nature of my mind. The persistence of this idea that I can drink like a normal man, this idea, this insane notion that suggests to me that I can have a couple of drinks. In the face of 16 years of insanity, I can have a couple of drinks. So this solution is is a remarkable 
hopeful thing for me in step two. Step three, I simply make a decision to do something about this information. Four through nine, four and five is me, six and seven is God, and eight and nine is you. There's no one else to play with, right? I do the work. I clean my side of the street first. I look at me. It's an interesting thing that if I want to, if I, if I choose this as a path, this process of recovery, if I choose to walk this path, before me, I engage in this journey with the understanding that there is no, it's not about the destination. It is not about the destination. It is about the journey. It is about the path that I walk, that process. Being a person who's all about immediate gratification. I want to get high now. How much would you like? How much do you have? <laughs> May I have it all now? Right? To be in this process um, is a startling new way of life. I, I, I have to find a way to relieve myself of this mental state, which is the purpose of the steps, the promise of step two that I could be restored to sanity. First, I must look at where I am. If I call somebody up and say, I want to get to the Alano Club, I'm lost and I want to get to the Alano Club, what's the first thing they will ask me? Well, where are you now? They cannot tell me how to get from where I am to there until we first determine where I am right now. That's what the steps do. First, first, where are you now? Step four and five. Where am I now? What is the current nature of the way I engage in the world? What is it with these resentments, this sexual behavior, these fears, these, these, the presence of these defects of character that run my life? I am a self-centered, frightened man. And in the 12 and 12, in step seven, second to last page, it says, I love doing that right there, that little thing I did with a particular page. It's very rare with me. It says, and I paraphrase, self-centered fear is the chief activator of all my defects of character. Either I'm afraid I'm not going to get something I want or I'm going to lose something that I have. And this stirs, this fear stirs up all of this attempting to control and manipulate and manage the world around me so that I can then be experience some level of peace. Of course, missing the point completely that the peace that I need and that I must find for myself is not out there, it's in here. And that's why this is an inside job. This journey that we do, we go within, and it begins in the action steps in four and five. I look at me. Where am I now? Having established that and the obvious, these defects of character, having developed, begun a relation, an honest relationship with self, I then look to God in six and seven to remove these defects of character because God, I, I ask God to remove them because I will remove the wrong things. I'm, enjoy, I'm particularly enjoying this defect of character. You may have this. <laughs> I'm going to like this. We'll talk, talk in a week. Maybe we'll slip. You know what I mean? Maybe not. Eight and nine, my relationship with you. First, clean it up here, hook God into the game, and then out into the world and begin to clean up the nature of my relationships with you. Very, very sorry. Here's your money. Back in the house. Right? Nice and simple. Nice and simple. Ten, eleven, and having done that, then as, as Doug talked about, the promises are at this point, and all of these remarkable things seem to happen. And that those promises, that was a very interesting part of the process for me because as I read through these promises, as I'm deciding whether or not this is in fact Going to work for someone as damaged as I am. Um, I had a therapist tell me prior to getting sober that she couldn't help me because I was damaged beyond repair. <laughs> I did not find that particularly therapeutic. <laughs> One of the promises was you will not regret the past nor wish to shut the door upon it. And I said, stop right there. That can't happen for someone like me. If you have lived the life that I have lived, if you have done the things that I have done, you would know that I will always regret my past. I will always wish to shut the door upon certain aspects of my past. That's not, and you know what this A and A thing you got here? This sounds good. Best things come across my path so far, and I'd love to do this. But let's just take that promise and take it off the table, because I'll take the deal without it. You keep that promise, and I'll take what's left, because I don't want to get to that point in this process knowing that can't happen for someone like me. I don't want to get there, have that not happen, resent you all so significantly for that, for, for leading me to believe that something like that could ha happen to a person like me, and, and have that resentment fester within me, and then I'm going to go out and die. So let's just take it off the table now so that I don't have to face that later on. And they, of course, did what they usually did, which was they said, thank you for sharing your own. Now let's, let's just move on. They ignored me completely. <laughs> Um, and I'm, I'm here to say that, that it has, in fact, come true for me. I do not regret my past, nor do I wish to shut the door upon it. And that is uh, beyond my wildest dreams. Um, I'll talk more about that tonight. But the, uh, um, in 10, having completed the nine step, the first nine steps, in 10 it says, uh, um, continue to take personal inventory and when wrong, promptly admit it. Um, 
it was at this point that I, real, I realized, well, apparently I'm not done with everything that's come before. The fact that I've cleaned it up, the fact that I've looked at it, the fact that taking these actions has created a change in my life, it has, it has done, it has changed me. I'm beginning to function differently than I did before. I'm beginning to see it coming and change my behavior and not create more information for the fourth step necessarily. It's slowing down. But the fact is I've really only just scratched the surface. I've scratched the surface. There are worlds within worlds here. This thing goes as deep as you want to go with it. And I had scratched the surface, and what 10, 11, and 12 suggest to me is please continue. Please continue. Do not stop. Continue to grow. Continue to change. And I thought, well, you know, just, you know what, do they, what do they want from me here? You know, I mean, good Lord. Right? I mean, I'm one of those guys that the financial amends for me. I looked at the financial amends I had when I got here, and I thought to myself, I've got to get married soon and begin having children so that I can then pass the remainder of my debt on to them when I die. Because there's, <laughs> this is going to become a generational thing, paying off my debt. It was just so insanely huge. And I did just as Doug suggested we do. You know, I began writing little checks and having conversations and making amends and little checks going out. When that one got paid off, you know, that... Ten bucks off of that got popped onto that one and then that one, and then it just started to really move, you know. And as I stayed so broadly enough, I became surprisingly employable. And jobs got better and better, and I was making more money and paying off more debt. And when confronted with huge debt, when confronted with seemingly hopeless odds, right, I went to my sponsor and I said, I, you know, I'm willing, but this can't be done. There's no way I can successfully complete this. I, I, it, it blocks me from even beginning. And he asked me one simple question. He said, how free do you want to be? How free do you want to be? And I said, I want the big buzz here, man. I want to be free. And he said, then begin. Then begin. Again, the path, the journey. Begin. Become the person who pays his debts as opposed to the person who figures out a way not to who makes it about them or that or this or the other thing, just become the person who pays his debts. If you owe a million dollars and you've got two dollars in your pocket and you give one dollar to that individual to say, now I only owe you a string of nines. <laughs> that is true, isn't it? And the action of addressing has taken place. I don't think the universe particularly distinguishes between ten cents or ten thousand dollars. You owe what you pay it. You give, take the action of engaging in the process, and you take the action of engaging in the process. You are in the process. And you, to the degree that you can commit to that is the degree that the freedom comes. That was my experience. Tan says to me, I continue to take personal inventory. And when I'm wrong, promptly admit it. The assumption there is is that I will be wrong, that I'm going to screw up. I am a flawed man. I stand before you, a, a horribly flawed man, right? who is on a process, who is growing and healing and changing and doing the best that he can along the way. That's who I am. That is who I am. I'm not, I mean, there, you know, we are not saints. The point is we are willing to grow along spiritual lines, demonstrating the willingness to grow along spiritual lines. I am terrified of flying, not bothered by it, not mildly disturbed, not uncomfortable with it, terrified. I am a terrified flyer. Plane leaves the ground, and I, my first thought is, um, this is wrong. It's wrong. I don't think God planned on little metal cylinders with jets strapped to them just careening across the skies all together with a bunch of people who don't seem to understand because they're all fine. <laughs> As you can see, fly, sitting next to me on a flight is an interesting experience. It's, by the time we land, I will have you terrified. You will <laughs> understand what's actually going on here. And I do that. Why on earth would I do that? I get to demonstrate on a regular basis that I'm willing to go to any lengths because I love Alcoholics Anonymous and I love the gifts that have been given to me as a result of this. So I get off planes shaky but humbled by the experience that, I, that this is what God has chosen for me. I'm not, you know, some people like Doug said, Doug is, loves it up here. Doug gets up here and he's happy and he's so comfortable. <laughs> he's just great, right? <laughs> loves it up here. I'm one of the ones that doesn't like this. I have never liked this. I do it all the time, but I don't, it's not my idea of a good time. I, <laughs> I, I never said a word in Alcoholics Anonymous for the first two and a half years that I was here. Um, I didn't say a word. I did not share. I did not do any of that. Um, I had a sponsor. I took direction. I had commitments. I cleaned up meetings, but I did not share in Alcoholics Anonymous um, because I was afraid if I told you who I was, you would uh, um, send me away because you looked like reasonable people, and that's what reasonable people would do. You go. <laughs> How wrong I was yet again. Um, and the only reason that I did share is that my sponsor directed me to do so. And uh, it's turned into this somehow. 
You know, it's very strange to me. Every time I get up, Carl laughs at me because he says, every time I get up, there's another friend of mine says the same thing. Listen, if you listen to the tapes of me when I get up, the first thing you hear is, <sighs> and usually Carl says, I put my hand on my face, like, how did this happen? Um, it wasn't my idea. Ten, I must continue to take personal inventory. And when wrong, promptly admitted, I am going to screw up. I am going to. I have every defect of character right now, standing before you. I have every defect of character I had when I got here. Here's the difference. In the beginning, I was at the mercy of them. I did not know how long they would last or how, how deep I would dive into the defect. If I woke up and was slothful, feeling slothful, lazy, and didn't want to go to work, I didn't go to work. You know, it's like, well, I wonder what's going to happen because of this. You know, because I mean, apparently I'm going to be at home today. I have <laughs> nothing to say about this. It just was in charge, you know. Wake up in the morning lustful. Like, uh-oh. <laughs> God only knows what's going to happen now. Now I may experience those same things, but I am no longer at the mercy of them as a result of the steps. I have tools that I can use to address this. I do not stay in the defect as long, and I don't go as deep. Sometimes it's just a blink of an eye. It's just a flickering. It's just a breath. And then it's gone. Other times it'll get a hold of me for a little while and then I'll, you know, become aware of it because consciousness expands as you come here, as you, as you participate in this. You take these actions and you change. And I become aware of it. And I can stop myself and make direct amends, right? I can stop myself and, and apologize. I can correct the behavior. I can stop in the middle of a sentence and go, you know what? That was crap. I'm going to start over again now, right? People in AA go, cool. Normal people are a little troubled by that when you. <laughs> How many personalities are there in front of us today? <laughs> but I can move forward. I can move forward. How free do I want to be? Do I wish to be restored to sanity, soundness of mind, relieved of the obsession to drink and use, so that I can be comfortable, sober, and walk the earth a free man? This is what I want. Can I find a way to bring passion to my life? Because when I got here, I was a hopeless man who was dying. I was soulless, I was dark, and I was alone. How can I come back and re-engage the human race, a god? have some acceptance of self, and move through this light. How can I have that? 10, 11, and 12 allow me to continue in this process. 11, I seek God. I don't sit at home waiting for God to call. Show yourself to me, and then I will believe. <laughs> Bad game. Bad plan. Right? I seek God. How? Through prayer and meditation. What do I pray for? Knowledge of his will for me and the power to carry that out. Period. That's me. I pray for knowledge of God's will for me and the power to carry that out. I figure anything else minimizes that. that that's what I need to pray for. And I, I find it interesting, you know, I'm not one of these that believes that God hears my prayers. I'm pretty sure that God is not some anthropomorphic being up in the sky. And when Earl hits his knees and begins to pray, God says, Excuse me, hold on a minute, Earl's praying, i got to get this. <laughs> this is usually rather fascinating, hold on. I'm gonna... Don't think that's happening. <laughs> I think that I don't pray so that God will hear my prayers, I pray so that I will hear them. So that I will be, God knows my prayers before I say them. God knows the prayer I will say tomorrow before I was born. God, that's, God's not in my image, okay? See? I pray so that I can hear these words, that I turn my will in my life over to this power greater than myself, and I hear my own voice speak these words. I hear myself being framed up, into in, in, framing my mind, my consciousness, my heart, my soul, so that I might go forward and do good works rather than Earl's works, that I might find a way to get myself out of the way so that I can be of maximum service to God and my fellows, because I don't have anyone else to play with, and I have... In my life, I had renounced God a long time ago and was very righteous in the anger that brought that about. I had renounced any connection to other human beings and felt very, very justified. And I can explain to you, here's the facts, folks. This is what happened. And most people, in the face of that, would say, go ahead and feel the way you want to feel. They just back off me. There was really no debating it with me because I'd lived an extreme life. And what that left me was right and alone, utterly, completely alone. So when I open myself and my heart up to God to pray for knowledge of his will for me and the power to carry that out, I position myself in the universe in a completely different way. And who needs to be aware of that, conscious of that on a daily basis is me. Who needs to be reminded of that daily is me. There are steps in the book in how to begin the day and end the day. There, 
My sponsor, I went to my sponsor, the late, great Donald Madden. I will say his name repeatedly while I am here and cry half the time that I do. I will love that man for the rest of my life. He was Alcoholics Anonymous to me. He was God's messenger to me. He was the one that, that saved me. There we go. <laughs> a remarkable man. And I, I, was, uh, I was going to meetings three or four nights a week in a place called Ohio Street in West Los Angeles. And right behind the podium. In the AA meeting is a painting. It's about three feet by four feet. It's a large painting of the serenity prayer. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And, I, and I'd been going to meetings there three and four nights a week for over two years, and I suddenly spotted that painting. <laughs> I was a little self-involved in the beginning. <laughs> I could see the here. And... Uh, I called Donald immediately, and I said, Donald, found a great prayer, shortest prayer I have been able to find. <laughs> You're going to love this one. It's the shortest prayer I found. I mean, this, you know what I mean? It's nice. It's, it's very good. A lot going on in there. He said, what is it? I said, I believe they call it the serenity prayer. And he said, no. My sponsor is telling me not to pray this prayer. Is this what I hear from you? And he goes, yes, that's what you're hearing. And the reason I'm saying this to you is because you're right. There's way too much going on in there. You're going to screw that up completely. <laughs> he had a point. God grant me the courage to, I don't know, what the hell. Some... <laughs> and he said, you want prayers? I'll give you prayers. Here's your prayers. I got two prayers for you. Here's what you do. And I'm like, ready. I'm going, this is very big. It's custom prayers from my sponsor. Right, how cool is that? I'll get little cards made. I'll have them laminated. Right? It says, prayers from my sponsor. You got these? No? All right. <laughs> I'm spiritual now, man. My prayers, right? And he said, all right, when you wake up in the morning, your crazy ass wakes up and your eyes open up and you're in the bed and you're already going and several voices are already talking to you, which was how I usually woke up. You know what I mean? It was you wake up and, the, and you just went, and the head said, we're glad you're up. We've been up for some time. <laughs> we got a few things we'd like to go over with you. First of all, you're a worthless piece of shit and there's no point in getting out of the bed. <laughs> Also, when you wake up and your eyes open up and you got to hold the covers and you're in the little bed thing there and you're like this, first, I want you to go, I want you to open up your clenched fists, because I usually woke up just, <laughs> wake up, open your hands, palms up and say, whatever. <laughs> you're starting to love Donald too, aren't you? Yeah. And I thought, great, got it, got it. And I'm thinking to myself, don't forget, whatever, whatever, whatever. <laughs> okay, I got whatever. And he goes, okay, and when you get to bed at night, I want you to get in the bed, grab the covers, pull them off your crazy ass head, right? Put your palms up like this and say, enough. <laughs> and go to bed. And I got, got it, whatever, enough, whatever, enough, whatever, enough. Three days later, it's like 9 a.m. I've had my hour of sleep that I'm getting at this point. Right? And I, and I, Donald, it's like 9 a.m. I've been up for three hours. And I called up Donald. Donald Madden. So he answered the phone. At least you would, could possibly mistake that this was him, right? <laughs> Donald Madden. And I said, Donald? He goes, what is it? I go, I'm doomed. Goes, What's wrong? Man? I said, it's 9 a.m. And I can't, I can't go another step. I can't do it. I'm done. I'm cooked. I'm fried. I can't do this anymore. I have no way I'm making it to tonight. It's over. And he said, all right, all right, all right. I can help. I said, good, because you're it. This is the only call I'm making. He goes, all right, I want you to take a deep breath. <laughs> he said, now say, enough. Said, enough. Because now take another deep breath. He said, okay, now say whatever. And I just paused and I said, you can do that? <laughs> you can just arbitrarily just stop a day and start another one? It's, look at the clock, Donald. <laughs> Okay, so is it Wednesday now? Is it Tuesday? Is it Thursday? What the hell are you talking about? He's going, settle down, man. <laughs> you can stop a day anytime you need to and begin it again. We're not beholden to the clock. Time is an abstract concept. Doesn't really exist anyway. Just, and I'm like, what? What? He goes, never mind. Don't get into that. <laughs> can I ask about that later? Yeah, yeah, later, later. Like in about 20 years, you can ask about that. Just stick to simple, simple, simple. It's nice for flowery. It's nice for ornate. It's all, but for us, I, my belief is for me, it must 
be simple. Ultimately, at the end of the day, this must be a simple program. Not easy, but simple. It must be simple. It is a magnificent thing to pick up the book and just rip it apart. Get into the words. Get into the, the stuff. Read the white part. You know, don't read, read lots of the white part and wrestle with all of this. I love that. I think it's terrific. The end of the day, it must be simple because you don't grab the new guy and say, okay, we're going to get into the concept of God now. This is going to take about 12 hours. Listen closely. All right. Uh, first, we'll get into the uh, Jesuit uh, expression of God, and then we'll go into the Benedictine monk. And then, uh, <laughs> no, it's do this, do that, do this. What I know about Alcoholics Anonymous will never keep me sober, ever. What I do will. It's a program of action. I must take these actions. The action of prayer and meditation. I pray for knowledge of God's will for me and the power to carry that out. Why do I meditate? To quiet the mind so that when the answers come, I can hear them. Because the answers don't, God, you know, God stopped calling me on the phone. He used to. <laughs> enough, enough methamphetamine, enough cocaine, you get calls from God. Or he'll just send messages through the radio. <laughs> when, you're dri- when you're driving the freeways, decode and license plates so you'll know what channel to turn to to get the God from message, the message from God. Just, that's all stopped, right? But the answers come in the form of a thought, a feeling, an intuition as I pray, as I meditate, as I quiet my mind. Meditation, I had a great discussion uh, with uh, Bubby. Is that the right way to say it? your name? Yeah. There you are. Yes, it's the right way. We talked about uh, meditation last night at dinner. We had a fight. We had a meal. We had a meditation talk. It was a well-rounded evening. <laughs> and the fight was really no big deal. My, uh, where I come from, if there's no blood on the ceiling, it was fine. It didn't go bad at all. <laughs> And we went to, uh, we talked about prayer and meditation. And uh, he asked me, what do you think of it? I said, well, meditation for me is to, to, for the body to be still and the mind to be quiet. With this understanding, it is not the nature of the body to be still. The body is designed for movement. It is not the nature of the mind to be quiet. So when I meditate and I sit and I ask the body to be still and the mind to be quiet, my body and my mind resist that at every possible turn. I said, you can do a, you can do a meditation counting from one to four. Breathe in one, breathe out two, breathe in three. Read that four, and then just go back and start. And that sounds very, very simple and monotonous, doesn't it? It would, be, it would be monotonous if you got to one through four several times in a row, but no one does. Not honestly. You sit down and you go, okay, okay, long term sober, spiritual guy. Good, good, good. This is going to be good. It's going to be excellent. All right. One. You know, my back hurts a little bit. Oh, shit. <laughs> okay, let's try that again. Okay. okay. One. Woman is very attractive. <laughs> okay, I'm right. One. My leg hurts now. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> and you think, I'm terrible at meditation, right? No, you're not. No, you're not. Because it's you're looking at it the wrong way. It's not about staying still and staying quiet. It's about having the willingness to recognize and acknowledge without judgment what the mind does and what the body does. And then to just come back. It isn't this. It's this. It's this. Center. It's this. We come back to the center. We don't present from the center. We come back to the center. That's what it is. So I just acknowledge, oh, I'm being lustful again. Come back. Oh, I'm self-centered. Oh, come back. Oh, the the hindrances. I'm self-doubt. Oh, just, you know, and not self-doubt. Bad (laughs) self-doubt. Lust. Bad man. Bad man. Screw that. It's just, it just is what it is. How uncommon for a human man to have doubt or fear or lust or envy or greed. How unusual. <laughs> to just see it, it, that it's there and not judge so much judgment. I have one New Year's resolution every year. Less judgment, more tolerance. Less judgment, more tolerance. Because they say ours is a code of love and tolerance. But for the rest of the world, it's love. Love. What's all about? It's all about love. Give love. And that's a beautiful thing. For us, it's love and tolerance. I mean, I think they knew who they were talking to. <laughs> we're going to have to kick tolerance right up there with love because I am by nature um, intolerant. I'm intolerant of myself and of others. It's the nature of being self-centered and afraid. It, uh, how could I not be? So to meditate and to get out of the judgment of the thoughts of my mind is to just see them for what they are and come back and come back and come back. And you find what happens as you continue in this seemingly meaningless process is an internal change begins to come. And you become to, as the book suggests, rely upon intuition. Right? Rely upon intuition. Not to lessen, to lessen the self-doubt and to know that there is a consciousness beyond mine. And if I can get myself out of the way, I can tap into it. 
and I can direct my life in accordance with that, which I think is much more of an I concept of God's will than mine. Right? Twelve, how long am I going to? I've got a while. Okay. Twelve. Didn't I just say that? All right. Oh, good. I was here, I was gone, I was back. It was quick. <laughs> Twelve. Having had a spiritual awakening is the result to work on the steps. The result to work on the steps. That was the whole point. To be restored to sanity, soundness of mind, to be relieved of the obsession to drink and use, to walk the earth a free man. Having accomplished that, having, having had that experience, is direct result of working these steps, taking these actions that were outlined before me, I can now practice these principles that are found in these steps and carry the message to the alcoholic who still suffers. I can practice these principles and carry the message. Third side of the triangle. I'll get into that stuff later. But I can be of service. How can I help? How can I help? Not because I'm a good guy. But because I want to stay sober. Whatever motivates you. I, 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 mean, I love it when people explore the motivation. Jeez, you know, am I, am I ready? You know, am I, am, I, am, I, am I framed properly here? You know, have I, have I missed a discussion group that I should be involved in for the next 11 months before I do? Finish 12? Great. Now, you can't keep it unless you give it away. One of the great brain twisters of AA, <laughs> right? Um, be a service. Donald Madden said to me, I will give you everything that I have. I will show you how to live a completely, fundamentally different life. The only thing that I will ask of you is that when you catch this buzz, which I'll talk about later, when you catch the buzz, you must now run and give it away to the guy walking in that door. Because there's a new wave of insanity washing up on this beach every day. And you must take your, cha- your turn in this human chain of recovery. You must take your turn. And I said, okay, I will. And I've been honoring that promise to him every day since the day he died. And I will, hopefully, God willing, and I believe he is, I will be honoring that promise for as long as I live. Um, it's the grace in life. It is. You think you caught a buzz getting sober. Give it to somebody else and watch those dead eyes light up across from you. I've been high on everything there is. I'm, I, everything. Everything. <laughs> and there's no buzz like that. No buzz like that, watching somebody come back from the dead. So I am of service. I am of service. Out of self, service, more God. Out of self, more God. Out of self, more God. Get Earl out of the way. Get me out of the way. If I spend most of my time getting me out of the way, I get much more done in life. Strange thing. It's a strange thing. Well, if I'm spending all this time getting me out of the way, once I'm out of the way, now what the hell do I do? It presents itself. I mean, we were having a discussion the other day, and I'm saying I, I, had listened, I read a quote from some woman who was saying, to feel useless is so silly. Because there is so much to be done. There is so much to be done. And the interesting thing about this for me is, is that in terms of the steps, what com- the understanding, the realization that comes as a result of me, God, and you in 10, 11, and 12, continuing the process that I've begun in here to scratch the surface, to wrestle with these concepts, to claw deeper, what happens is, is that everything flips. Everything flips. And suddenly I am confronted with the fact that I've had it completely ass backwards. I've had it wrong. I come to you and I do these steps and I become a member of Alcoholics and I work in this and I do this and what motivates me is I am desperately alone and afraid. I've been alone for so long I didn't even know I was alone until I'd been here for a couple of years that because I, I had nothing to compare it to. I was just alone and isolated and dark. And I, suddenly I remember calling my sponsor up and saying, and I was upset. And I called him up and I said, Donald, something has gone terribly wrong. And he said, what is it? And I said, I love you. <laughs> and I was serious. I swore on a mountain in Mexico in 1974, I would never, ever love another human being again as long as I lived. And I would never, ever tell you who I was, so there's no way you're going to love me. This is Earl. You like him, you don't like him, it's got nothing to do with me. I'm out. I'm out. And, I, and so you come into my life, if I'm dating you and you call up the next day and say, I'm marrying Ed, my response is, excellent. Where do I send the gift? I don't care. Right? You stay in my life, you don't stay in my life, you live, you die, I don't care. You don't care because I'm too damaged, too broken, too unavailable for loving and being loved. I can't do that. And all of a sudden I work this thing because I don't want to die drunk. And as a result of doing these things in this life, I discover that I love this man. What the hell's going on in here? I was upset. Be be aware, newcomer. I actually heard a guy once at the podium say, if you're new and you haven't worked these steps, run for your life. And I went, what? Donald went, shh, you sit right there. What am I talking about? It's backwards, man. I thought if I came here and I loved you, then you would love me. If I was honest with you, then you would love me. This would be my reward. This was what I sought. Was this. I will love you so that you will love me. And I, cause apparently it's gonna happen anyway and I gotta, I gotta have something to say about this. 
right? If I'm honest with you, then you'll be honest with me. If I'm, if I'm respectful of you, towards you, you will be respectful to me. And I was completely wrong. That is not my experience. Something much more remarkable happened. Um, has, because I had become, I was honest with you, I became a more honest man. Not an honest man, a more honest man. Right? I move in the direction of honesty. As I was um, loving to you, what happened was I was becoming a loving man. And I was respectful to you. I was becoming a respectful man. I was no longer demanding respect. I was giving it. I was no longer demanding and requesting and controlling and manipulate you so that you would love me. I was just loving you. And that, the, like I said, it's in here. It's not out here. I was after the big house on the hill and the cars and the women and the drugs and the notoriety and all of that stuff. And I got all of it. And I was dying on the hill. I was dying on the hill. And I came into Alcoholics Anonymous and I found myself in a one-room apartment driving a little 1968 Volkswagen that you had to park on a hill. So that when you roll down the hill and pop start it and roll it in. I was, and I would go to meetings and if the meeting was on flat ground, I would just leave the Volkswagen running outside. <laughs> I was the only guy in AA that knew you got two gallons, two hours to the gallon. <laughs> I'd just run out there and people would come out and nobody would steal it. I mean, it was worth like a dollar. <laughs> you know? And that's how I got here. Destroyed. And it was, and, and the happiness that I experienced in those first few years of, of my involvement with Alcoholics Anonymous has, is with me today. It's because I learned the car is never going to make me happy. I will not know true happiness from an automobile or a, even, even a pretty woman or a kind woman. I, I will not know happiness over there. I will not, the money, right? Now, do I seek money, property, and prestige? Sure, I'm alive. It's what we do here. We play. So I play the game, and I have a lot of fun, and I do all of that stuff. But what I have to remember always is that it doesn't come first. It can never come first. These things will not make me happy. What makes me happy is the inside work, the inside job. Do I have a relationship with the power greater than myself? Do I have moments in my life where God is like my breath? Yes, I have those moments, right? And they sustain me, right? Is it more important to me that I am loving towards you than you towards me? Yes, it is, because I have seen the benefit and the value of that. It's the inside job. I wish to know peace. I wish to know comfort. I want the ease and comfort that came with those first couple of drinks that was talked about. I want that, but I can't get it out here anymore. I've got to go in here and do the work. I, if I want it, i got to come get it. i got to come get it. i got to take the actions. Sitting in the back of meetings and listening to other people talk about their experience and their journey is a lovely experience, but it will not sustain me. I must engage in this 12-step process. I must act in defense of my own life. I'm, and the cool thing about this is I'm going to have to get sober somebody else's way. If, you, if I come in with my consciousness, which is when you kick and come in here, alcoholism is in full effect. This isn't about alcohol. It's about alcoholism. It's in full effect. The obsessive nature of my mind is in full effect. I work the steps to address it. I work the steps to address it. When I do that, I am transformed as a result of these actions. And I begin a new process and a new path. Make sense? You with me? Thank you. <laughs> yes, go ahead. If I engage in this daily reprieve, if I do all three sides of the triangle, I'm in good hands. I'm in good shape. There's a line in the book, again, that's rarely looked. I mean, we, we see it so often. We hear it so often. We just kind of glance over it, you know. It's where a lot of us just check out for a little while in a meeting. When they read a portion of Chapter 5 in the beginning of meetings, the first line is, rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. That's some very good news for a hopeless alcoholic of my type. That's very good news. My concern is, what is thoroughly? How do I, what is thoroughly? The steps are designed to relieve me of the obsessive thinking. The steps are designed, now that I'm physically sober, to come in and be comfortable, clean, and sober, to be relieved of this obsessive state of mind. That's what they're for. That's their purpose. But there's more to the game, isn't it? This thing of sponsorship. I do these 12 steps. I go to meetings a lot of times, and they say to guys, um, in the meeting they go, uh, is there anyone in here with over a year of sobriety that has worked all 12 steps? Would you please stand? And all these people stand up, and they say, for you newcomers, here's sponsors that are available for you that have worked all 12 steps. We know you can't give away something you don't have, so here's the people that have it. Here's the people that have worked all 12 steps and are now willing to take you through that process. Get their names and numbers, hook up with them, right? And I think, there it is, sponsorship. Being a sponsor, being available and willing to take someone through this process that was so freely given to me. People ask me, well, what should a sponsor be? The only reason I'm talking about this is he asked me to. <laughs> Carl the Sober. You have Eric the Red, now you have Carl the Sober. 
who's a, who's a very dear friend of mine, and I love him dearly. And you would be you would be very proud of your Carl if you saw the work that he does in the United States. If you saw the service that he provides, it's really remarkable. It's an honor to know him. Um, sponsor's job, in my opinion, is to take somebody through the steps. And you got to understand, this is all just my opinion. Somebody else will get up and tell you the sponsor's job is this. Somebody else will say, oh, it's more like this. Or, oh, it's more like that. It's more like that. And nobody's wrong. It's just great. I mean, I love, and you'll see people actually get to the point where they're going to come to blows about these conversations. And I think, it's great. Alcoholics stand up squaring off over the process of recovery. <laughs> it's so important to them. This isn't about getting it right. It's about doing it. Doing it. A good way to do it is I went, I went looking for a sponsor. I thought, I, they said, what's the sponsor? I said, what's the sponsor? And they said, the sponsor is somebody who's got what you want. And I said, well, I would like to drink. <laughs> so maybe it's a little early to be throwing the ball back in my side of the court. You know what I mean? And I've since come to believe that what I want, I want a sponsor who's got what he wants. Because I think that's a very good definition of happiness, wanting what you have. Wanting what you have. So it, it, less and less and less it became about the kind of watch he had on or the car he drove or the money he had or the house that he lived in or his standing in AA or his social status or any of that crap. What it had to do with was the light in his eyes. That's what it had to do with was the light in his eyes. And that's what I wanted. I'm this crazy lunatic. Donald Madden got up and spoke in a meeting, and he was insane. This was a man who was committed to 23 mental institutions. <laughs> He's the only person I've ever known who was evicted from the nut house. <laughs> They three said, you have to go. You have to go. If you don't leave now, you'll be one of the ones that never leaves. You have to go now. And they spit him out into AA where he became this incredible, alive, passionate man. He wasn't afraid to let you know that this mattered a great deal to him. He was very upfront about the fact that he cared deeply about Alcoholics Anonymous and about this path. And it was evident in every day of his life and the number of men that he was there for. Um, and I became one of them. And I went up to him and I asked him, uh, I said, will you sponsor him? And he said, yes. And you don't have to like what I say. You don't have to think it's a good idea. You just have to do it. <laughs> and God bless him for that because it just took so much crap off the table that I was, I was digging in my pockets to put it on the table, and he just removed it by saying that to me. You don't have to like what I tell you. You don't have to think it's a good idea. You just have to do it. It's a program of action. It's a program of action. That's what will get you what you seek. See, like I said earlier, you got to get sober somebody else's way. I cannot bring my consciousness, my alcoholism, right, in here, the obsessive nature of my mind in here, and use my experience. My experience is getting loaded hourly. And I'm going to come in here and use that consciousness to work this? Doomed to fail. I've got to find this guy who has what I want already a little further down this path who was willing to share it with me, sponsor, who's willing to share it with me. And then when he gives me direction and suggests that I, I go this way and it makes no sense to me, the fact that it makes no sense to me is irrelevant. All that matters is that I'm willing to do it. And by doing a contrary or new action, an action contrary to my old thinking, which is what didn't get me to AA, it almost kept me from ever getting here at all, right? God got me here. I didn't figure this out, as I'll explain later. But I had to take an action that made no sense to me. That was a good sign. What you're asking of me makes no sense. Excellent. Let's do that. And I did it. He took me to a meeting and he said, they make 550 cups of coffee every Friday night and you're going to make them for the next year. I said, the hell I am. I don't even know these people. <laughs> he said, fine, then drink. I said, you see, there's no talking to you people. <laughs> I'm trying to have a, just a polite conversation here and you go right to the drinking thing. Fine, I'll make the coffee. So I had to make the coffee and I was a little self-centered and I was a little crazy in the beginning, unlike now. <laughs> and... They gave me this box with all this stuff, all the coffee stuff, the stuff, the little swizzle sticks and the creamer and the fake sugar and the real sugar and the this and the that and the that and, the, and a list of stuff you got to buy. So I'm like obsessed, man. I was like, oh, Jesus, I'm big. 550 cups of coffee is a lot of coffee when you don't know how to make coffee. <laughs> so I'm at the market. I'm getting the stuff. and I got the stuff. and I'm in the car and it's like, you know, Thursday morning and I'm double checking the list. <laughs> got to be there in 36 hours. Okay, we got to be there. We got to be there. We got to get there early. And you put the pots together and you get the whole thing together and you got it all set up. And now I'm drinking coffee while this is going on. So I'm getting a little jacked up. <laughs> And I'm making the coffee, and I got the pots out, and I got the pots out, and I got the table out, and the table out, and everything's ready, and they had the meeting before the meeting, and I got the coffee out. They didn't blow any of the fuses in the building, because I put the pot over there, and a pot over there, and a pot over there, and a pot over there. And I got my little table set up, and my condiments, and the coffee, and the people are coming in, and going, have a coffee. <laughs> you, coffee. Come on. And then they come up and go, thanks. Who the hell is that guy? And they get the coffee, and the swizzle thing, and the guy put the swizzle stick down on my condiment table. <laughs> uh, Bro, does that look like trash can to you? You want to pick that up, please? Hmm? 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 It's like, dude, sorry. All right. You know, by the end of the meeting, I'm just like a parrot in the back of the room. <laughs> up till 4 o'clock in case anybody wants to call me and find out how I made that great call. 
And you know what? I would leave Friday night every, after that meeting thinking, you know, I feel good. I feel good. It's, I can't explain it. Because I couldn't put together, you go to a meeting, sponsor says get a commitment. I think, I'm the new guy, I'm the grunt here, right? So I get to do the, I get the job. I have to serve these people their coffee. Because I'm the new guy. So everybody can come in and go, give me a cup of coffee, new guy. <laughs> you over there who knows nothing about recovery, bring me coffee. <laughs> Thanks for pointing that out. I've heard something about a four-step. What's your name? <laughs> and that's not what it is. What it is is, oh, you're new? Cool. We got this great thing we're going to give you. You're going to make the coffee. Yeah, yeah, I know. It looks like we're giving you the grunt, grunt job, but really, 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 we're not. We're giving you one of the greatest gifts we've got. Have you ever heard of this spiritual principle of service? Out of self, more God. Out of self, more God. I'm sure you look like a self-centered alcoholic, girl. Probably never thought about anything but yourself your entire life. It's like, if, you're, if I'm talking, I'm talking about me. If you're talking, I'm wondering how this relates to me. <laughs> You seem like that, Earl. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to give you this fantastic gift. We are going to give you an opportunity for this tremendous relief. We're going to get you out of yourself. You've got to make this coffee. You've got to prepare all this stuff. You've got to break it down. It's going to take you about four and a half hours every Friday night. So every Friday night, you're going to go home relieved just a little bit more of the bondage of self. You get that, Earl? Uh, no. No. <laughs> no, I don't. Which was why Donald spoke to me in newcomer language when he said, do it or drink. Got it. All right. Why are you making coffee? Don't want to die in a gutter. Apparently, this is the thing between me and the gutter. Make the coffee. But that's what it is. It's this incredible gift that we resist well into sobriety. When I, I mean, you can have a room this size in L.A. and say, okay, we need five, feet, five people to help us clean up. Can we get some hands? The guy can stand there for a minute waiting to get five hands. And they usually get them because they're sponsors scanning the room going, where is that little shit? Get your hand up. <laughs> <laughs> guys in the back ducking behind other guys so their sponsors don't spot them. Jesus Christ, get your hand up. <laughs> to clean up a meeting. I figure I go to alcoholics now to save my life. I've had commitments the whole entire time. I've been sponsored the entire time. Because I'm smart? No. Because of good sponsorship. That's why. Because I was willing to get sober somebody else's way. Because I knew my way wasn't going to work. I tried to get sober and I couldn't. Could not get sober. I had to do it somebody else's way. I had to use their consciousness. If I'm taking the contrary action, I'm here and the guy says, make the coffee. Everything inside of me says, screw you. I don't make coffee for people. I don't know. I don't make coffee for me. <laughs> he says, fine, that's a lovely sentiment. Or, oh, now, now do it or drink. It's like, fine, I make the coffee. Resistant, right? Defiant alcoholic, right? I go and make the damn coffee, and I suddenly feel better. Interesting. Interesting. New concept. As a result, new consciousness. What is the result of that? Why? The result of that, that result is because I took a new action. Action. I took a contrary action suggested to me by a sponsor. New understanding, new awareness. Oh, gets a little buzz here. Get a little relief. Dig it. Coffee. Call him up and go, you know that Friday night coffee commitment? Uh, yeah. He's assuming I'm going to say, I gave it up. I go, I'm sweeping up on Saturday night at Ohio Street. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, you didn't I? Catching on, right? And then I got this commitment over here, and then a guy says they take out panels. I said, great, what's a panel? That's where you gather up four or five guys, and you drive them out to a prison or a nut house, and you go in and you talk to people that aren't listening. It's great. <laughs> and then you drive them all home, and you have a meeting on the way, and you have a meeting there, and you have a meeting back. I said, I'm in. And I did it. And I took them to, I had two panels. I took a panel to San Fernando Valley Juvenile Hall, beginning of the disease, and to County General Hospital Alcoholism Ward, end of the disease. And I will never forget my eager little two and a half years sober, got my guys, right? I'm like the lead dog here, you know what I mean? I got, I got two and a half years. Little do they know I'm hanging on by a thread. I'm insane. And we're in my car, but I'm acting like I got it going on. Yeah, we're going to county. And I'm looking at the map going, Jesus, I hope I can find this place. Is, what the hell? And we get up there and I walk in going, how you doing? You got the nurse there with a thousand yard stare. You know what I mean? Been there 20 years. She's seen it all. And here comes me, you know, all polished up going, hi, we're members of Alcoholics Anonymous and we're here to help some drunks. And she just kind of looked at me and said, of course you are, baby. <laughs> oh. <laughs> in we go. See the guy laying in the bed. Five point restraints. Arms, legs, head. He's in the bed. He's yellow. He's my kind of yellow. Getting sober yellow. Right? He's, looks like he's got a football in the bed, but that's his liver. He's dying of alcoholism. He's not getting out of there. He's not going to leave that place. He's not going to leave that bed. He's going to die in that bed. His liver's gone. He's dead. Right? He just hasn't done it yet. He's laying in the bed in the, you know, 
kicking, detoxing. The guy in, in five-point restraints. And I walk up and say, excuse me, sir, we're from Alcoholics Anonymous, and we're going to have an AA meeting. If you want, we can put the chairs around your bed. Put the chairs on your bed, and we'll just have the meeting right here with you. And he looked me right in the eye, and he said, why? I don't have a drinking problem. <laughs> and it scared the shit out of me. Because I stood up in that bed, and I went, I have that disease. That's my disease. The difference, as Norm Alpe used to say, the difference between me and that guy is seconds and inches. Seconds and inches. That's it. That's it. Who knows? This man may have been a captain of industry, accomplished far more than I might ever hope to in my life. And alcohol took it all. Took it all, and it's now going to take his life. And he is still in denial. The shroud of denial just lays over him. Why? I don't have a drinking problem. I'm going to die from drinking, but that's not a problem to me. It was astonishing to me. And man, that, I left that hospital so grateful to be an insane little two and a half year old sober guy with a car full of terrified newcomers. We're all looking at me going, what the hell was that? What the hell kind of meeting was that you took us to? Is that like the dead guy meeting? What the guy? <laughs> and I'm yelling like Donald, and all of a sudden I hear Don me, shut up, you little ungrateful bastard. <laughs> Turn around, very proud of myself. Right? They're all in the back, scared to death. And I was in the front seat, scared to death. But together, <laughs> together, we went, and we every month, right back there, two and a half years, right back there, right back there. Why? Because I don't want to die drunk. Because my sponsor said do it, so I did it. And you know what? My life changed. The way I look at it is this. If, you look at, if I look at my life as a pond, just a pond of water, and that is my life, just a little pond. All oh, for so many years, I threw poison into the pond, thinking it's only affecting this little cove over here, this little cove. I'm getting high in this little cove, and I'm just getting high now. It's just today that I'm getting high. I'm not getting high forever. I'm not getting high for 10 years or 15 years or 16 years. I'm just getting high this time. I'm just throwing a little, little poison over there. The, the pond is big. The pond will be fine. What I don't know is, is that the universe is the universe, and the truths are the truths. And as, I, as that poison hits the surface of that pond, the ripple effect of that dropping into the pond touches every single area and aspect of the pond. Nothing is left untouched. And as I think, I am only doing this little bit here. I am poisoning it all. I am cutting myself off from God and my fellows and ultimately from self. I'm just completely, completely gone. I come into Alcoholics Anonymous and, and the sponsor says, here, take this and throw it in the pond. Whatever. All right. I start throwing this stuff in the pond. I start throwing service. I start throwing step one. And step two. And these things that I don't understand, but I've become willing somehow to wrestle with them and I throw them in the pond and I throw them in the pond. And I think this is addressing my alcoholism. This little cove over here, right, that is my recovery cove, right? And I think it's just going in and this is going to help me not drink. But that's all this is doing. That this is the sum total value of this will be that I will become comfortable sober and I will not drink. I will become free. So I throw it into this, the recovery cove. And, but what I don't understand is the same thing is happening except in reverse. The ripple effect of that is rippling into every area of my life. And even though I have not been working on my anger because I'm an angry, angry man as a result of my self-centered fear, I'm not working on my anger. I'm working on staying sober. But suddenly some guy walks by in a meeting and says something to me that demands action on my part. I need to kick his ass for that because he just shamed me and I can't allow that to go unchallenged. And I reach for my anger and it's not there. And what comes out is some guy walks by and makes a crack at me. I look at him and I go, Peace. And I walk, and I walk away thinking, who the hell did that? What was that? Now all of a sudden these guys are coming up going, that was the coolest thing I've ever seen, bro. Where'd you get the strength to do that? Well, I don't know. I was gonna hit him. And all of a sudden this comes out. I don't know what the hell happened. Alcoholics Anonymous took the anger from me. It picked my pocket like a thief in the night. Is what it did. You, this is so far past not drinking and using. You get into this step process, you work these steps so that you won't die drunk in the gutter, right? And what will happen is, is that a life will happen. I've had people say to me, Al Al the steps, Alcoholics Anonymous, the program of Alcoholics Anonymous is about love. It's about respect. It's about balance. It's about peace. It's about all forgiveness, acceptance, big one, acceptance, right? All these things, right? I respectfully disagree. I say that Alcoholics Anonymous is about staying sober. That's what this is about. However, I must engage in a process of action in order for me to recover, for me to stay sober. I must take these actions. The result of these actions cause me to bump into and wrestle with and experience peace and love and tolerance and acceptance and forgiveness. It, we, 
As an alcoholic, I so tried to compartmentalize my life. Okay, I'll do this and it'll be about sobriety. I'll do this and it'll be about money. And I'll do this. It ain't like that. It's the whole human in balance brought into this life. Brought into this life. If I get sober and engage in a spiritual path in order to do so, a spiritual path will impact my entire life. And suddenly, I won't feel good about stealing cars anymore. I won't feel good about lying to her. I won't feel good about misrepresenting myself. I will change. It is inevitable. It is without question. It is without fail. If I take the book, I think the book's I was talking about alcohol on page, what, 37? And the, and, the, and the text is up to page 164. It's about living life sober. It's about being free. And I need more freedom than simply not drinking will give me. I need more freedom than that. I need the big buzz. I need the, the granddaddy of all buzzes. I need to be able to breathe in and out and get into that. I need to get between those. I get back to right here, right now, which is the only place I can live a life. It's the only place I can love you. And oddly enough, I've known you for two and a half days, and I already do. I love you. I love you. Um, you are mine. <laughs> I am yours. You know? We belong to each other. We come from different lands, and we belong to each other. Here. Here. Got to live from here. Got to live from here. Can't live from here. Cannot live from here. Must live from the heart. Must live from the heart. Must find the courage, the faith, the strength to move into the world from here, from my heart. To be, to be able to say, I'm a man. I'm a dominant male. I am a proud man, and I am flogged, and I know fear, and I worry, and I, and I wrestle with concepts that seem easy to others, and they're not for me, right? I must sponsor, I sponsor a legion of men. There are those that will tell you that's because, that you want to know how sick someone is? Look at how many people they have to sponsor to stay in the game. <laughs> Uh, my guys would suggest I'm a very, very broken man. <laughs> There's so many of them, right? And, and they, they're one of the many, many lights in my life. They, they have no idea. They have no idea how much they mean to me. So if you're new and you wonder, mm, the steps, I would suggest that this, um, do them, experience them, and you will discover that it goes so far beyond not drinking and using. It is a design for living. This is the backbone of that. This is the, the, the heart and soul of this. This will begin to, be, this will become alive and it will breathe in your life and it will change you. And I promise that that change will be a delight, that you will, you will love the change that you experience. And it's 4.30, so peace. That's it. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.